to begin. I work sometimes with refugees, but I also work mostly actually with homeless men at the moment. So I do have some experience working with refugees, but maybe I'm less of an expert compared with Shelton. Um, but last year, um, I did uh, see over a number of months a gentleman from Sri Lanka. Um, his refugee claim had been uh, denied, and he was sort of in this nebulous zone of maybe awaiting deportation, but also submitting a, a, a humanitarian and compassionate grounds claim to stay in Canada. Um, and he had HIV. Um, and in fact, when he first arrived in Canada, he was admitted to hospital with the complications of AIDS, and that's how his HIV was diagnosed. And uh, he no longer had coverage for his health care with the changes that had happened that we're going to talk about. Um, so he was seeing me fine, but uh, he couldn't afford to pay for his antiretroviral medications. And uh, our clinic, thankfully, was able to cover those medications for him, but our policy was to just provide them uh, every month. And uh, he was also able to sometimes access medications from other HIV organizations for free. But it was very chaotic for him to go to the pharmacy every month and to never know where exactly his medications were going to come from. So occasionally he would miss doses. And uh, now, unfortunately, uh, his HIV has actually um, mutated and is resistant to some of those medications that he was on because he missed so many doses. So. That was just one example, and there are many, many examples that Canadian Doctors for Refugees has uh, been collating in a database. Um, so one example of a negative effect of the cuts that were made to healthcare that we provide to our refugees in Canada. Um, so uh, I'm just going to now talk a little bit about the history of uh, the refugee healthcare in Canada, and then I'm going to talk about the changes that were made in 2012. And um, and then I will outline the healthcare that's provided right now because in November of last year, November 2014, um, uh, the government was forced by the courts to uh, revise the change. So they they haven't reinstated all the healthcare that existed prior to 2012, but they made some changes. And uh, and yeah, and then Chantal will speak. So. Um, our refugee health program, it's called IFH, or Interim Federal Health, has actually existed since uh, after World War II, so it's existed for longer than uh, public health care has in Canada. And that's because we recognized as a society that uh, people who are arriving as refugees and refugee claimants uh, are unlikely to be able to pay for health care on their own. Um, and it also recognized that uh, new migrants are vulnerable, and vulnerable people uh, often, if they're forced to pay for health care, are going to delay seeking health care. Um, I think also there's a recognition that maybe health providers wouldn't accept people who maybe couldn't pay for health care. Um, and also there's higher rates of certain uh, medical issues. So refugees are often subject to torture um, and often have mental health issues to deal with, uh, maybe some infectious diseases as well uh, from living in camps. Um, so there was this recognition. So we had this public health care system, or, or sorry, paid for health care system for our refugees and refugee claimants. And it was actually in the legislation back from way back then. Uh, it said that uh, the federal government would pay for medical, dental and care, and hospitalizations for immigrants and others who were at any time, quote, subject to immigration jurisdiction or for whom the immigration authorities feel responsible. So it was actually left quite wide open. Um, uh, so, uh, the cost of this system, of course, has grown uh, since after World War II. And uh, in 2012, uh, the government decided to make some cuts to IFH, the Interim Federal Health Program. They did this without consulting uh, with any healthcare professionals. Um, and they did it because they estimated they could save about $100 million over five years, which amounts to 60 cents per Canadian. Um, and uh, also, by the way, is only one tenth per person of what uh, it costs for health care for an average Canadian. Um, but really, uh, that, so that's what the federal government said. But, uh, but really, what they were doing was downloading some of those costs to the provinces. Um, and also, it didn't. Their their estimation didn't really take into consideration societal costs of 
ongoing health care issues, so they didn't really take into consideration all those people who were going to be Ill, unwell, unable to pay for health care, and then uh, unable to work, um, uh, and have long and suffer long-term consequences as well of not being able to deal with trauma, growing up as kids, maybe, who have experienced trauma and not having dealt with that as children. So none of those costs were taken into consideration. Um, also, just as an aside, refugee claimants still pay taxes, so, uh, you know, I, I mean, some, some uh, critics of the IFH program uh, maybe would say that these claimants are, you know, leeches or quote unquote leeches on the healthcare system, but uh, they do pay taxes just like you and me. Um, so that was one change. Um, massive cuts to the uh, healthcare provided to refugees, and I'll go into more detail. Um, another thing that changed in 2012 was something called Bill, Bill C31. I don't need to get into too much detail about that, but uh, basically what happened is it created a faster processing time for refugee claimants. And what that meant is that uh, they only had 15 days from uh, their claim date to provide a, a their paperwork to the government for their refugee claim. And that meant that there was a lot less time for refugees to put together their submission to gather all the necessary paperwork from their, their home country, for example. Um, it uh, also made a distinction, this bill, uh, between different kinds of refugee claimants. So there's something called more language, but it's called a, a Designated Country of Origin, or DCO, and basically the government made a list of what they deemed safe countries where probably there wouldn't be refugees. Um, the problem is uh, the way that they defined that was that uh, those countries, so they, they use this definition, a rejection rate of 75% or higher for refugee claims, and they also reviewed whether the country has an independent judicial system, uh, recognizes democratic rights and freedoms, and has civil society organizations. So they made this list of 37 countries. But the problem is some of those countries uh, are maybe not safe for some minority groups. So one of the countries on the list is Hungary, and pro probably all heard of uh, discrimination of Roma people in Hungary. And there are also a number of countries where, which are known for their discrimination of LGBTQ uh, populations. So Mexico, uh, Chile, South Korea are also on that list. So this bill created this distinction between these two kinds of refugee claimants. And the ones who are from these so-called safe countries uh, had to submit their claims even faster. And in the cuts to the refugee health care, we're given even less health care. In fact, basically, we're given none at all. Um, so uh, people who were from a DCO country with the cuts, they uh, were only provided with health care uh, if it was a threat to public health and safety, which is almost never. So uh, many people, uh, for example, there was one person who presented with a heart attack uh, in a downtown Toronto hospital and was turned away. Um, pregnant women uh, turned away. Um, so, uh, this is pretty devastating. Uh, so back in 2012, a group of doctors formed, uh, to form, uh, they came together to form Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care, um, which, as I've already mentioned, they documented cases of harm, and then they also launched a legal challenge together with the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers and uh, Justice for Children and Youth, which is a nonprofit legal aid clinic. Um, so we're going to hear more about the court case from Chantal, so I won't get into that. But as a result of the court case, um, in November of 2014, uh, the court uh, ruled that the government had to uh, renege. So they had to uh, go back on the changes that they made in 2012 and uh, reinstate some of the health care that's provided to our refugees. So at the moment, I'll just go through a little bit um, what is provided. So basic coverage of core medical services, so basically OHIP-like care, is provided now um, to all active refugee claimants, regardless of whether they're from a so-called safe country, as well as refugee claimants who've been rejected and are from a country to which we cannot deport. Um, uh, also, all uh, active and rejected refugee claimants who are children or pregnant women are now covered um, with these core medical services. Um, and as in uh, before, even with the 2012 cut, 
government-assisted refugees were always covered, so and they still are covered. Government-assisted refugees are a minority of refugees. Uh, they arrived to Canada already as uh, accepted refugees, so they are folks from camps usually uh, who the government of Canada has actually gone over to these camps and already accepted them. So they actually didn't suffer as many um, cuts. Their health care didn't suffer as many cuts in 2012. Um, so the government has also restored access to medication um, to uh, a number of refugee claimants who had had cuts. So now prescription drug coverage is paid for for uh, all active and rejected refugee claimants who are children and pregnant women and all government assisted refugees. Um, so. Uh, this is getting very complicated and detail-oriented, and I don't need to go into it in too much more detail, but I think that it is important to know that, I mean, uh, medication is is important. Like, if you can't, if you're diabetic and you can't pay for your insulin, then you're not actually going to be treated for your diabetes, even if you can see a doctor for free. So, uh, it was a real struggle when, even for those government-assisted refugees, medications were not paid for. And uh, finally, another big cut that was made in 2012 uh, is that coverage for supplementary services, and specifically uh, counseling, uh, which is particularly important for refugees, uh, that was cut. And then now, uh, it has been restored for government-assisted refugees, so those people who come over and they already have status, um, and uh, for accepted refugees as well. Um, so, I think that's it, uh, except that I also just want to mention briefly that um, Canadians feel very proud of our public health care system, but in addition to all uh, these details about refugee care that I've already talked about. There are also 500,000 Canadians who don't have access to health care. And uh, that's often because there's a wait time uh, in, in Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. So uh, there's, a, as you may know, there's a three month wait for all, all people who arrive to Ontario, Quebec, and BC. Um, so whether it's you or I who have gone away and come back, uh, we have to wait three months to have our, our health care uh, restored, or new, new immigrants who are here um, uh, on some other, like a family immigrants, they also have to wait for three months, so they're also uh, not covered. Uh, there are also ac access issues for other uh, people, such as non-status people or people who are undocumented in Canada, they have no access. Um, and there are issues as well for temporary foreign workers. So uh, temporary foreign workers are actually an exception. They, as soon as they arrive, they have OHIP in Ontario. But of course there are issues around actually getting to healthcare for temporary foreign workers, whether they're uh, live-in caregivers or seasonal agricultural workers. Um, they can't always leave their place of work and uh, you know are in a place where they don't have a lot of power to go and see the doctor when they, when they need to see the doctor. Um, so I think I will leave it at that, and I'll ask Chantel to come up.